Welcome to uh, Evaluating Critical Components of Natural Gas Compression Equipment. I'm uh, Dave Wharton, Senior Vice President of Global Business Development and Marketing at IMW Industries. And our speaker today is John Dunaway. He's Director of OEM Sales at Cook Compression. Uh, so John uh, has a, six years of experience in the gas compression industry with Cook. Uh, with roles in engineering and technical sales. Currently, he's responsible for managing critical component sales to compressor OEMs. John is a sought-after speaker and trainer and conducts training presentations throughout the U.S. for cook compression OEMs. John holds a uh, Bachelor of Science and a Master of Engineering and conducted his Master's of Mechanical Engineering from the University of Louisville using mock human circulatory systems to study mechanical behaviors of heart valves. John, his wife Tiffany, and their two daughters uh, call Louisville, Kentucky home, so we certainly appreciate him heading up north to be with us today in downtown Vancouver, British Columbia. Uh, a quick note about IMW. Uh, IMW has been manufacturing uh, industrial machinery since 1912, so we're just over 100 years old. And we have been involved in CNG compression since 1984. Uh, we're the only company in the world that's dedicated to non-lubricated uh, CNG compression. And um, we have a variety of standard configurations that you'll see at the bottom of your screen, including uh, the world's only single skid uh, CNG uh, station, the complete CNG, uh, the low footprint compact CNG, then our uh, clean CNG series of single and twin systems, as well as our industrial CNG solutions that include pressure reduction uh, kits for industrial virtual um, pipeline solutions. And of course, IMW is a subsidiary of clean energy out of Los Angeles, California, and uh, Clean Energy is famous for developing the natural gas highway across the United States. Now, uh, we just want to make you aware that we have these webinars monthly. Uh, they're focused on industry information uh, with uh, related products and services and industry speakers. Our next seminar, entitled A Compelling Case for CNG Vehicles, will be hosted by Steve Yavara, who is Director um, uh, of Markets and Technology at uh, NGV America. So please uh, take a moment, visit our website, uh, sign up for our March 26th uh, webinar hosted by Steve Yavara. Uh, another note. Uh, for those of you who are professional engineers or engineers in training, um, this seminar is uh, appropriate for your continuing professional development credits. And if you are sitting in a boardroom now with several engineers around the table, uh, I recommend that you appoint a scribe and take down the attendee's name, email, title. Send a quick email off to webinars at imw.ca with the letters CPD in the subject heading, and we will send you out a certificate uh, of confirmation for this course that you can use to claim your CPD credit. Just a quick note of housekeeping. You'll note up in the upper uh, right-hand corner of your screen, there's a control panel. You can <laughs> press the hand-raising sign there. You'll see it the first arrow. Uh, to let us know that you'd like to give a verbal question, and then we will open the microphone for you to ask questions. If you're uncomfortable with that and would prefer to go uh, messaging, you can see the screen below there, and just feel free at any time to send us a question. We'll be uh, responding to them throughout the seminar. And without further ado, I'd like to pass this over to John. Welcome, John. Thank you, Dave. And uh, first, I'd like to start by thanking not only Dave, but the whole team at IMW for giving me this opportunity to, to speak to you guys today. It's a privilege and an honor. And I hope you guys uh, learned something that you can take back to your day-to-day your -day function and help you out. So uh, to get things started, I'd like to give everybody a quick overview of Cook Compression. Those of you who may not be familiar with us, um, Cook is a worldwide leader 
of the component design and manufacture of critical parts for reciprocated compressors. Uh, we also offer uh, monitoring and repair solutions as well for uh, existing equipment in the field today. So the markets we cater to include uh, natural gas, both uh, uh, upstream, midstream, and downstream, uh, petrochemical and refining, enhanced oil recovery, and industrial markets. So basically anywhere where you can find a reciprocated compressor, Cook is going to be there and have expertise in, uh, in that particular application. Cook Compression is a division of Dover Corporation, uh, which Dover is a Fortune 500 company, uh, over $8 billion in annual revenues traded on the New York Stock Exchange. We offer a broad range of compressor valve, sealing, and emission control technologies for, again, reciprocating compressors. And uh, that's going to be the focus of our discussion today is learning a little more about these technologies. Uh, we also have a highly experienced engineering staff with expertise across all compressor products and applications. So not only can we manufacture the components that the compressors need to operate, we have the expertise in-house in that's required to, to get them to run, run better, last longer, and seal, uh, seal gas more efficiently. Uh, lastly, we offer a line of sophisticated analyzers and monitoring systems through our Windrock product line that allow you to see inside the compressor uh, that monitor the internal uh, condition that allow you to uh, change your mindset from preventative to predictive maintenance. So a quick overview of what we're going to cover today. Uh, first, we're going to define and give a quick overview of each critical component required to uh, achieve gas compression. So we're going to tell you what the components are called, what they look like, and give a, a brief overview of how they function. Next, we're going to describe the benefits and challenges surrounding non-lubricated CNG compression. Then we're going to review Cook's approach towards extending service life in non-lubricated CNG compressors. And lastly, we're going to talk a little bit about a project that uh, Cook and IMW have been working on jointly over the past several months that involves a standardization of, of IMW's product line and what the benefits will be of that change to the end customer. So let's get started by uh, defining critical components. So I wanted to uh, describe to everybody what we're looking at here in this slide. So this is a cutaway view of a compressor cylinder. So if you, uh, you, could, you guys can notice my mouse moving around here, uh, down here at the, the bottom left-hand side of your screen will be what we call the running gear or the crankcase. So you'll have a crankshaft, a connecting rod, and a crosshead that's rotating, causing this piston inside the compressor cylinder to reciprocate. So the way the gas compressor works is low pressure gas will enter the cylinder from the top side of your screen through a series of valves. It will be compressed on both sides of the reciprocating piston and it will be delivered through a, a series of discharge valves. So basically you're moving gas by compressing it, raising its pressure. So what are the components required to, uh, to make this event occur? Well first we're going to look what we call the wiper and the pressure packing. And you can see it's the wiper and pressure packing are enclosed in an assembly that's bolted to the back side of the compressor cylinder. And the wiper packing's goal is to prevent any oil that is contained back here in your crankcase that's lubricating your, your crankshaft and connecting rod bearings from migrating down the rod and into your compressor cylinder. Secondly, the pressure packing is there to prevent any gas pressure that's built up in your, in your uh, compressor cylinder from leaking into your frame or your crankcase. Next, you have piston rings that are um, designed to slow the flow of gas between each end of the, of the uh, cylinder. So they're preventing gas leakage between the piston and the cylinder wall. Next, you have a series of compressor valves, which uh, act, at, act as pressure actuated check valves that allow gas to flow in and out of the cylinder as, a, as it's compressed. So. Uh, we won't talk in too much detail about valves in this course. We're going to focus more on the sealing components as they tend to be more, uh, more of a critical item in non-lubricated applications. But uh, certainly if there's a question on valves that you want me to, to answer at the end, I'll, I'll certainly take those. Uh, next item we have is what's called a rider ring. And so that is installed on the center of the piston typically, and it uh, supports the weight of the assembly as it moves back and forth inside the cylinder. So before we move on, I want to make a, a very critical distinction here between a lubricated and a non-lubricated compressor. You know, you, you heard me talk about oil 
back in the crankcase that's lubricating the, the crankshaft and the connecting rod bearings. And that's going to be present in a lubricated and a, a non-lubricated compressor. But what makes a lubricated compressor different is the fact that oil is going to be introduced, you can see my mouse here, right here at a point inside the cylinder to lubricate the piston rings and the rider ring. You're also going to have an oil introduction point here in the packing case to lubricate the pressure packing. And these are the components that are rubbing and sealing. The purpose of the oil is to extend their life. Um, however, there are some uh, challenges certainly associated with uh, CNG compression, which is meant for vehicle fueling when it comes to uh, lubricated equipment. For one, you have separate uh, group pieces of equipment designed to deliver that oil to the, uh, to the cylinder, which involves a separate set of pumps, uh, things we call the biter blocks that divert the oil to different lubrication points, and also instrumentation involved. But the critical point to make with a lubricated compressor, the fact that once that oil enters the cylinder, it is going to be absorbed in the gas stream. It's not like your oil back in your frame or in your crankcase that's being constantly recycled. This oil is lost in your process gas. Eventually, it's going to go out through your discharge valves into the gas system, which creates some uh, real challenges when it comes to a vehicle fueling application, which is what, one of the things that makes IMW unique the fact that all their compressor cylinders are non-lube, meaning there's no oil introduced into the uh, into the cylinder or in the packing, and all the seals run completely dry. So we'll get started with a little more detail here on uh, pressure packing and wiper packing. So we'll start with uh, the pressure packing case. And, and as I mentioned before, the pressure packing is contained in an assembly. And the assembly consists of a series of metallic cups, so usually cast iron or steel is the material of the, of the cup. And within the cup, you'll have a series of packing rings. And the rings can be made of a variety of both metallic and non-metallic materials. And the function of the packing case assembly is to seal high-pressure gas and prevent leakage from the cylinder into the frame or atmosphere. So if you can notice my mouse here, in this example, all your gas pressure would be contained right here or, uh, on the top side of your screen. So in a CNG compressor, that could be anywhere from you know, 20, 30 PSI in the cylinder all the way up to 4,500 PSI. And on the back side of your packing assembly, you're going to have atmospheric pressure. So what we know about high-pressure gas is it's always going to seek a low-pressure source. So you're relying on the packing assembly to keep that gas in the cylinder. Within the assembly, the packing rings or doing the sealing work. So they seal around the rod and against the packing cup to prevent that uh, gas from migra migrating down the case assembly and out into, the, uh, out into the frame or the crankcase. The assembly is sealed against the cylinder with the end gasket. So when you install this device, you have this end gasket right here where I'm pointing with my mouse. It seals the entire cylinder off, uh, packing assembly off against the cylinder. And lastly, the rod rings are going to be pressure actuated seals, meaning that they rely on uh, the presence of gas pressure to cause them to, to seal against the rod and against the packing cups, which we'll describe in further detail here in a couple slides. So this is a breakdown of what the assembly looks like taking apart. And so what we're trying to illustrate here is for the, the folks out in the field, the technicians who service uh, compressor equipment, uh, the rings are going to be what wear out over a period of time. And so when you're doing maintenance on the, the compressor, you can take the entire assembly out, uh, take it apart as shown here by removing nuts on the end of what we call the tie studs. And these tie studs, you can see, go all the way through the cup stack to hold everything together. Once you take this assembly apart, the individual rings contained in the cups can be removed and replaced. And easily put back together and, and thrown back into the unit. So typically the metal parts are either reused or repaired and the, uh, the rings are what's, what's replaced during maintenance. So how does all this work? So we know that we have a, we could possibly have a high level of pressure in the cylinder and we have this little few inch long packing case that's designed to uh, take that pressure down to zero. So to really understand what's going on inside the packing case assembly, we're going to look at some data that we took off of our, our in-house test compressor. And in our test compressor, we're looking at not only pressure in the compressor cylinder, but we're looking at pressure 
in each packing cup behind each ring set. So we're really seeing what's happening between the cylinder where you have hundreds to thousands of PSI gas pressure all the way back here to the back of the case where you should have little to no pressure. So that leads to the, uh, to the graph here on this next slide. And to give a little explanation, looking here on the x-axis, you're looking at your crank angle. So this is telling what, what point in the stroke that piston's at, whether the gas pressure is low or high. Um, and on the y-axis, you have the actual pressure number. So looking at this blue line, this is, the, uh, this is the pressure inside your cylinder. So it's cycling between suction pressure down here at about 700 PSI up to about 1,600 PSI, which is your delivery or discharge pressure. So this next line is a red line. This is the, the pressure behind your first cup, behind your first ring. And this is a ring we call a pressure breaker. So all this ring is doing is monitoring or metering the flow in and out of the packing case as your uh, cylinder moves from suction to discharge. So it's kind of smoothing out that pressure change, rate of pressure change um, as gas pressure changes in the cylinder. But what's of interesting note are the following data points. So this is the gas pressure behind each of the sealing ring sets. So as you can see, each ring set is slowly and little by little knocking the gas pressure down to almost zero once you get to the back of the case assembly. So in essence, this is how the, the packing case is functioning. All the rings in the set are doing a little bit of the work, sharing a little bit of that load to, in order to knock the pressure down to a manageable level to the back to the back side of the case. And so that's why you'll see in a packing assembly you'll have several ring sets. This is also why low pressure packing assemblies have fewer ring sets than higher pressure assemblies because as pressures get greater, we need more uh, seals, more sealing power in the assembly in order to knock that pressure down to an appropriate level. So that's how things work on kind of a macro or a higher level. So what's actually going on inside each packing cup that causes the ring to physically seal gas? And that's what this next slide is going to illustrate. So if you can picture here in the center, this is an illustration of your piston rod. So it's going to be reciprocating back and forth as you cycle from duct suction to discharge uh, strokes. The left-hand side of your cylinder, uh, your uh, slide is cylinder pressure. The right-hand side is going to be atmospheric. So all this gas on the left-hand side of the screen is trying to rush to the right. So within this cup, the packing, this packing ring set is going to have a slight amount of side clearance. So the width of this cup or this ring is going to be slightly less than the depth of the screw within the cup. So that side clearance will allow the ring set to float laterally as that rod moves. And that movement creates the side clearance that allows gas pressure to fill the cup and surround the ring, which creates the loading forces required for that ring to seal gas. So for example, you see this loading force gas pressure on the outer diameter of this ring set is creating a loading force downward that causes the ring's inner diameter to seal against the rod's outer diameter. So you can see there's a loading force right here where my mouse is moving. So any gas pressure that wants to leak down between the ring and the rod is going to be sealed off. Additionally, you have a loading force on the face of the ring that's pushing this, this uh, further down ring on the downstream side of the groove up against the packing cup face, which is preventing gas from leaking around radially. So essentially that's what we mean by a pressure actuated seal. That gas pressure is creating the loading forces required for that ring set to seal gas. So now I want to talk about uh, some different ring styles. And the previous slide was kind of a representative example. There are several different uh, designs and materials used for packing rings. But the most common ring style that you'll see in compressors today, both lube and non-lube, is a ring style called the BTR. Uh, it's been around for, for 20, 25 years. Um, it features a radial and a butt tangent cut ring that are typically made from a filled Teflon. So here's your radial cut ring and here's your tangent cut ring. And you also have a backup ring on the back side of this tangent cut ring that's there for to provide structural support. So without getting into too many details of the design of this ring, the key takeaway here is this tangent cut ring is doing most of your work. So that tangent ring is what is loading up against the rod as pressure fills, fills the groove, and that's what's squeezing down and creating that loading force. 
this backup ring, as you can see, has a large amount of clearance over the rod, so it's not really contacting that rod surface. It's more, more or less there to keep this tangent ring from getting pushed down, uh, down the rod. Um, so again, I mentioned materials for the radial and the butt tangent portion are typically made from a filled PTFE, which stands for polytetrafluoroethylene or Teflon. Backup rings are typically made out of a, a bronze or a peak-based material, which peak is uh, polyether, ether, ketone, which we'll, we'll talk in a lot more detail about materials here in a few slides. Um, this ring set is single acting, meaning it only seals in one direction. And for the technicians out there to understand the correct orientation of installation, uh, they must be installed with the letters on each face of the ring facing the pressure source. So if you can watch my mouse here, there'll be a letter on each segment of the ring, which indicates for the technicians in the field what side of the ring needs to face the pressure. So next we'll talk quickly about wiper rings. So the purpose of a wiper ring is to keep the crankcase oil in the crankcase by wiping it off the rod. Remember we talked earlier about the separation between the crankcase oiling system in the compressor oiling system. And this ring is what you're relying on to keep those two systems separate. So in this uh, in the graphic here on the right-hand side of the screen, use your crankcase. That oil is going to uh, collect on the rod, try to migrate down to the compressor side. You're relying on this oil, ring, oil wiper ring to scrape that oil off the rod and drain it down through an oil return in the system back into the crankcase. Um, how the ring works, it's typically there are special edge geometries, or there would be small wiping lands or edge point of contact type designs combined with high spring tension to allow the wiper ring to shear the oil film off the rod. So a pretty simple concept of what it's trying to do. However, it's, uh, it's critical in the performance of a non-lubricated CNG compressor. For, for one obvious reason is you want to keep the oil out of the compressor um, to keep it from migrating into the gas stream, but it's also critical to the, uh, extending the service life of the other components like the packing rings and the piston rings, which we'll explain here in a couple slides. Questions coming in here? Um, yeah, John, we just had a couple of questions here. How do you develop your wear materials? Well, uh, that's, a, that's a good question because it's critical in, in the absence of oil to have a, a material that's uh, designed specifically to survive in that environment. And the, the design of the material um, it's really takes a lot of research and development effort on our end. So you know, we mentioned that the base materials are typically Teflon and Peak, but you'll have a lot of uh, fillers and additives into those base materials that will allow that ring to function in an oil-free environment and not only provide just standards lifetime, we want to extend that and allow that compressor to run just as long as a lubricated machine. And I do have a slide here in a couple minutes that talks in further detail about what the wear materials are that we're using today. But as far as the development process goes, it involves a lot of lab testing, uh, in-house wear testers at our facilities, once we qualify which materials and which blends work the best, then we'll, we'll take them out for field testing uh, over a long haul and make sure that they, they give us the results we're looking for in the field. So these final materials would be proprietary to cook them? Yes, yes, proprietary blends. And, and over the years, we've developed several dozen different blends. So that, that's something that, that we feel is a, something that differentiates our company is our engineering expertise and, and ability to develop specific materials for specific applications. Great, thank you. So to move on, we'll uh, change the topic to piston rings and riders. So in this graphic here, we'll, we'll start with the to discussing the piston rings. And they're pointed out here as uh, smaller items that are installed on, the, on each end of the, of the compressor piston. And the piston ring's function is to stop or reduce the flow of gas between the piston and the cylinder. So in this example, if you have a double acting compressor cylinder, uh, right here you're pretty close to bottom dead center, which means the gas pressure on the crank side of the piston is going to be very high when you compare it to the gas pressure on the head end of the piston. So again, high pressure gas is going to try to migrate its way towards a low pressure source. So you're relying on your piston rings to stop or slow that, uh, that flow of gas between the piston and the cylinder. 
Um, secondly, the rider ring has a completely different function. Its goal in life is to keep the piston from contacting the cylinder wall. So it's there to support the weight of the piston and rod assembly as it moves back and forth in the cylinder. Um, typically, there's a single rider ring. It tends to be a much wider component than the piston ring, and that's because we want to have enough rider ring surface there to properly support the weight of the assembly. Um, additionally, we, we design special features into the rider for, to prevent it from sealing against the cylinder wall like a piston ring. So we have built-in leak paths in the rider ring that uh, prevent it from, from uh, pressurizing. So to give a few notes here on, on some typical designs you'll see in, uh, out in service, Usually what you'll see in a piston ring or a rider is a single piece or a two piece angle cut design. And you know, we'll start with, with discussing the piston ring. So with the piston ring, the key to the design is the, uh, is the joint. So there's gotta be some sort of a break in the ring to allow it the freedom to move within the, within the groove. And so picking that joint is usually an, an exercise in give and take. So we're trying to get the most reliable design we can that allows us the, uh, the best sealing efficiency possible. And what we find is that the angle cut design is very robust, it's easy to manufacture, and it gives us good enough leakage protection in most of your applications. So you'll see that, uh, that in most of your cylinders, particularly on the, the lower stages of a CNG compressor. Uh, next, for the other applications that, that may require a little bit better leakage prevention, you'll see a something called a seal joint or a multi-piece ring used in higher stages to reduce blow-by. And that's what's shown down here in the bottom right-hand side of your screen. That's an example of a seal joint design. And as you can see, the, the joint kind of interlocks and overlaps, creating a, a very tough path for gas to escape paths. So that gives us much better uh, leakage prevention. However, um, as you can see also, the the cross section of this ring gets rather thin at certain points, so it reduces the, the robustness of the design. So oftentimes we'll use this style in conjunction with angle cut rings uh, in order to keep the loading on that the seal joint low. Additionally, this joint is a little more difficult to manufacture and it's a little more costly, so we, we only use these ring styles in, in situations where we need them. Uh, just the, about three questions have popped in here. Okay. So just thought I'd ask them. Um, Eric has asked generally how often do the seal rings need replaced? Well, that is a, a very good question that doesn't have a, a single answer. Um, generally, the target is the 8,000 to 12,000 hour range. Um, those numbers can be influenced by a number of factors, including the cleanliness of the gas that you're pumping, um, you know, how well your machine's aligned, what gas pressures you're operating at. But if you select the correct materials and the correct designs, you should be able to get a year of runtime, if not more. That's typically what we shoot for. Okay. So Bob asks, what prevents the rider ring from wearing in one spot due to gravity? Well, typically it, it will wear in one, in one area. Um, it is, going back to this slide, gravity is the, the force that's acting on the rider ring. So it's the bottom side of the ring is taking the brunt of the punishment. Um, what we do is through a, a calculation that we make, we determine how wide that rider ring needs to be in order to properly support the weight of the piston. And so we're, we're trying to keep that bearing load under 5 PSI for a non-lubricated application, and that's the industry standard that, that gets us acceptable life. So basically, the heavier your piston and rod assembly is, the wider that rider ring needs to be to properly support the weight and keep the loading down. Now, I've got one question here, and I'm, I'm just struggling with some of the wording here, so maybe you'll be able to answer it. Okay. But the, the question, the way it's worded is, and it's from uh, Javier, is can we use piston rings PTFE in a hard hardness, I think it's meant to be hardened cylinder? Um, So we're looking at the hardness of the cylinder. Um, at the, depending on the hardness, I don't see any issues using a PTFE. I, the thing, the key that we look for in the contact surface isn't necessarily the hardness, it's more the surface finish. So we're looking to keep that within a 12 to 18 RA finish to allow the transfer film to properly 
develop, which is something we're going to discuss here in a couple slides. But um, the hardness isn't isn't our big concern. It's the surface finish quality. Okay, that's it for now. Thank you. Uh, so next note on on riders, uh, typically they'll they'll include side notches, and it's kind of tough to see. But if you look up on the top upper right hand portion of your screen, you can see where I'm I'm, I'm mousing over an example of a side notch, and what that does is that prevents the rider ring from loading up like a piston ring. So any gas pressure that builds under the ring will be relieved through the side notch. And again, typically filled PTFE or peak based materials are common for piston rings and riders, certainly in non-lubricated service. Um, again, on the lower pressure side, we use the PTFE as it's, uh, it's higher availability, it's very good, um, uh, lower cost, and it wears pretty well. Uh, the higher stages, you'll need to upgrade to a peak which has better temperature and pressure resistance. However, it's, it's more expensive, so you don't use that as universally as you would PTFE. So next slide, we're going to talk a little bit uh, about non-lubricated CNG compression in particular. So we're going to talk about the benefits and the challenges that surround this, uh, this particular application. So first, we'll go through the benefits. Um, if we all remember from a few slides ago, in a lubricated compressor cylinder, all the oil that's injected into the cylinder is going to be absorbed by the gas stream, meaning in a in a CNG environment, the possibility exists that that oil is going to make its way into the fueling system of the, of the vehicle. And that has a very negative effect on the performance of the engine, you know, both from a, a performance and a, an emissions standpoint. So going back to the source where the oil is coming from and eliminating that and going to a non-lubricated compressor helps to eliminate this concern. Uh, next. Uh, reduced operational costs due to reduced oil, oil consumption. So again, in a lubricated compressor, all your oil is, is essentially going to be lost to the gas stream. So you're constantly having to replenish your oil supply, which adds cost. And, and that cost is not, not there in a non-lubricated environment. Um, next item is reduced capital and operating expense, expenses from the elimination of equipment required to deliver and handle the compressor oil. So we talked a little bit about the equipment required to deliver oil to the compressor cylinder, the pumps, the divider box, all the tubing and instrumentation involved there. There's a cost to that both up front and uh, ongoing through maintenance. Um, and secondly, if you have a lubricated compressor, you got to find a way to get that out of your process and on the uh, delivery side. So there's coalescing filters and things like that that are required in a lubricated CNG compressor skid that, uh, that aren't required in the non-lube application. So next, what are the challenges surrounding a non-lubricated CNG compression? Well, first, uh, from a sealing component standpoint, again, the packing rings and the, uh, the rider rings and the piston rings, the elimination of lubrication increases heat at the sealing surface and can reduce the life of the rings if not properly accounted for. And, and heat is a, is a big thing for a packing and ring manufacturer. It is the number one item that, that helps that causes the, the life cycle of the parts to be reduced. So we're always looking at ways that we can reduce the amount of heat generated at the ceiling surface, and we have some special designs that help us do that that we'll talk about here in a couple slides. Another challenge, there are space constraints. You know, CNG packages tend to be uh, as compact as possible. That's certainly, we, we don't want to, to take up any more footprint than we, than we need to. And from a packing side, that can be a, uh, that can be a challenge, you know, because sometimes that uh, we would like to add features such as water cooling to the, to the packing ring or to the packing case that allows, uh, allows us to pull more heat away. That's not really an option in a CNG application due to the complexity and the envelope concerns that that, that system would create. So we've got to find other ways to, to uh, get the heat away. Next, there are high linear piston speeds and high pressures at the upper stages increase heat at the ceiling surfaces. So one of the uh, things we're looking at from a heat generation standpoint is pressure. Uh, if you remember the slide where we showed the rod ring being loaded up against the rod, well, it's being loaded up by gas pressure. And the more pressure in the environment, the harder that ring squeezing, the more heat is generated. So. With the CNG application, the pressure is pretty much fixed at that 3,600 to 4,500 PSI range. So as a packing and uh, ring designer, we have to find uh, 
ways to get our components to last in that environment. Lastly, uh, close coupled frames create challenges for wiper seals. And so to define a close coupled frame, um, that would be in a situation where the crosshead would come just to, to right up to the back side of your oil wiper packing. So basically there's no distance or distance piece in place to separate and keep that oil splash to a minimum. So special considerations need to be made to keep that oil wiper from getting overwhelmed with the amount of splashing going on inside of your crankcase. So that's another consideration that needs to be taken as well. So you, you may be thinking, wow, look at that long list of challenges. How do we get, get good service life out of the non-lube compressor? Well, I can say that, you know, certainly through experience of IMW and, and cook compression, we have several decades of experience with excellent service life in this type of application. The key is to take the proper considerations, both in the compressor design and in the component design, to make things, uh, to set things up to work in this environment. Um, and I'll, I'll give you an example of, of some folks who tried to get the benefits of a non-lubricated compressor skid without uh, taking the proper precautions. So what these folks did is, and we've heard several stories of, of this instance taking place, so they went out and bought a lubricated compressor, decided they didn't want to deal with the oil anymore, and they just shut off the oil supply to the compressor cylinder. Well, those folks uh, didn't run much longer before they had a major failure on their hands. For one, their compressor components weren't set up for non-lube, and two, the compressor itself was not properly uh, designed for a non-lubricated application. So it didn't have the proper baffling in place to block the oil source. It, um, the speeds were too high. Uh, the piston wasn't long enough. It just was not set up correctly. So um, for that particular end user, they were pretty disappointed with what they got. But um, again, it requires upfront design and engineering, both from the compressor and the component standpoint, to uh, achieve a good service life out of a non-lubricated CNG compressor. John, we've got a couple of questions here. Chris asks, how do expander ring sets function differently? I have seen sets with steel expanders on low pressure, higher diameter uh, pistons. Um, yeah, that's the Okay. Point. Well, uh, what an expander does, and I'll, I'll go back to the slide that shows piston rings and riders, is it is a, a, a device that is installed underneath the inner diameter of the piston ring that expands it outward against the cylinder wall. So a piston ring functions kind of in the reverse direction of a packing ring. It's using gas pressure to push it out against the cylinder wall. And where we would use an expander is with, when the pressure differential across the piston is very low. So that means there's not enough energy there to properly load up the piston and cause it to seal against the cylinder wall. So that's where we'll, we'll go to an expander ring um, in lubricated applications, we'll go with steel, but most of the time in non-lube, we try to keep the metal out of there, so we'll go with some sort of a plastic like a peak. But again, the function of that is to load that ring outward, create an additional force to, to push that ring against the cylinder wall. And uh, Nico asks, does the ring change on different stages? I mean, when it comes to material and sizes or specs? Yes, it sure does. Um, you know, on the lower stages, you're typically going to see angle cut designs made out of a filled PTFE-based material. Um, that's just to keep things simple, and, and you know, that te Teflon is readily available, lower cost, and it will give you the uh, performance you need at those lower stages. Using a higher-end material like peak there would be overkill. However, as pressures get higher in the 3,000, 2,500 PSI range, You've got to go to a material that has better temperature resistance and better and higher strength, so it can withstand the, the environment. So that's when we'll go to a peak-based material, and oftentimes we'll change the geometry of the ring, going to more of a seal joint type design, due to the fact that those higher pressures are more prone to leakage. So yes, you'll see the design of the rings change from cylinder to cylinder based on the operating conditions. One last one before I let you continue. What is the maximum RPM of non-lube compressors? I assume it's lower than a lubricated unit. That's from James. Well, that's also a good question. Um, the industry standard is about 750 feet per minute, so it's not really an RPM calculation. It's a linear piston speed calculation based on the stroke and the RPM. Um, have we pushed the limits beyond 750? Absolutely. Um, but getting, again, the faster it runs, 
the more heat's going to be generated, the less life you're going to get. So staying in that 750 feet per minute range has proven to have to give long life and reliability time after time after time. So okay. we tend to stay in that area. Great. Thank you. No problem. So let's go back here to the next slide, which is a little information on Cook's approach towards non-lube CNG component design. And so what we were really looking for to extend the service life of these machines is a combination of upgraded materials and proper design as being the key towards extending service life. And, and we feel this is something that, that separates us. We're not simply looking at throwing an upgraded material into, into the machine and, and to, to gain a higher service life. Certainly material selection is very important, but what we feel is, is a separator here that's going to take us to the next level is the product design. So we're looking at designs that not only generate less heat, but remove more heat from the ceiling surface. So we're trying to keep that heat off the ceiling surface. We're trying to uh, reduce oil carryover through wiper design. And um, combining that with upgraded and engineered materials is going to give us the best, of, uh, the best life we can possibly get. So now moving on a little bit into uh, material selection. So the challenge that we're up against is selecting a wear material to survive in the absence of oil. You know, if you can picture a, a lubricated surface, it's, it's not all that difficult. Um, you know, you've got that oil there to, to give you a cushion, and, and that's, that's great for wear part. But um, for the reasons we discussed earlier, oil is, is not something you want in a non-lubricant CNG application. So from our standpoint, we're looking for a material that will lay down what we call a transfer film on the, on the counter surface that it's sealing against. So if you look in the graphic on the right-hand side of your screen, this counter surface represents the rod. And you can see it's kind of a wavy surface, surface and that represents the, the microscopic surface finish on the piston rod itself. So while it may look smooth to the, to the naked eye, within the surface of the rod there are peaks and valleys. And so what we're doing with the transfer film shown here coming from the base material, is for the first few strokes of life, that base material, which would be the ring in this case, lays down a layer of itself into the peaks and valleys of the counter surface. And that material film then adheres to the counter surface and creates a, a self-lubricating and lubricated environment. So the ring is basically running against a layer of itself, which therefore extends its life. And that's our, that's our challenge, is to find a material that will lay that transfer film and run for a long period of time against the layer of itself. And in order to do that, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, um, we have an extensive materials development program that we uh, that requires lab testing and, and field trials to get that proper blend of material. You know, again, PTFE and PEAK are the base materials, but we have the key is in the fillers and the additives to get this transfer film to behave the way we want it to, we have to get that right blend of the right amount and the right type of filler. And that's what, what separates our proprietary materials here. Another note on the last bullet here is that oil carryover will wash away this transfer film and accelerate wear. And this is one of the reasons why uh, wiper performance is so critical in a non-lubricated application. Because um, any oil that gets on that counter surface is going to pick up that transfer film and wash it away. Well, what that means is the base material has got to lay another transfer film, and then another, and another. And um, very quickly you'll see that uh, material wear out in a hurry and uh, cause a, a uh, shorter than expected service life. I was fascinated to hear earlier when we were discussing the impact that this has on maintenance process and procedure, in that in a typical lubricated compressor, you, as you're doing an overhaul, you literally soak the materials, mm -hmm. if you will, in oil, here, it's it, as far the opposite way as you can get, where you would strip any possibility of oil out right down to the point of using surgical gloves to avoid human hand oil transfer. Absolutely. And, and that kind of leads into the next slide where cleanliness is very critical in performing maintenance on any non-lubricated compressor to make sure that any oil, whether it be from your finger or from an outside source, is, is not in contact with any of the sealing surfaces to allow that transfer film to properly develop and adhere to the to the counter surface, and that that's very critical. Um, and not only when we build the assembly in our shop, but when packings are rebuilt out in the field, field technicians need to be aware of that as well. 
So the next slide uh, gives you a list of some common materials found in, in non-lubricated CNG piston rings and, and packing rings. And it kind of gives you an evolution of, of where things started. Uh, Carbon-filled Teflon was really the first non-lubricated material. And it's, it's fairly common, um, lower cost, gives decent performance in the lower pressure uh, realm of things. However, it, it does not lay a very good transfer film in the absence of, uh, of moisture. So in dry gas applications, this material doesn't work very well at all. So that kind of evolved into uh, a polyimide filled Teflon, which if you guys have ever seen a, the, the rings that have a yellowish tint to it, it's likely that's polyimide filled. Gives better performance than carbon filled Teflon, but uh, it's, it's, it was the industry standard a few years ago, but it's, uh, cert it's been kind of superseded today. And so that leads into uh, the filled peak materials, which are, are commonly used on the higher pressure applications. So again, peak being the base material, special fillers being used to allow that peak to run in a non-lubricated environment. And that's what you're going to see today on the higher pressure cylinders, anything in the 2,500, 3,000 PSI range and higher. So lastly, we get into uh, to today's top of the line material, which is called TrueTech 3330. So this was developed by Cook over several years um, in lab and field testing. And it's a PTFE-based material with proprietary fillers to allow the transfer film to, to be developed and to last for a long time in both wet and dry gas applications. So it's really got a very broad range of where we can use it. And certainly in the non-lube CNG uh, compression industry, it's, it's a very good choice. And so we're going to talk about that as it's applies to IMW compressors here in a few slides. And the next two bullet points uh, we already covered about the making sure cleanliness is uh, paid attention to during maintenance. So next we're going to talk about uh, product design. So again, what we're looking to do from a ceiling component standpoint is to re reduce the amount of heat generated at the ceiling surface. So first, let's try to understand where the heat comes from inside a compressor. First thing you got is compression of gas. So that's when you squeeze the gas, it gets hotter. That's the laws of physics. So what we can do about that is make sure that the compressor is sized correctly and the pressure ratios are, are, are adequate enough to keep that discharge gas temperature in a, a relatively low range, somewhere between 250 and 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, next, you have friction of the piston rings in the, in the riders as they ride against the cylinder wall. And lastly, you have the friction of the packing rings. And so this is what occurs when that gas pressure causes the ring to squeeze down against the rod. And this is what we're going to try to address with uh, specific product designs. And so that leads us to uh, today's best available technology for packing rings, which is uh, something called uncut or solid ring technology. And what we call this ring, we have a designation for it of a BTUU. So you remember the BTR from an earlier slide. A BTUU consists of a radial tangent ring pair, just like the BTR, but what makes this ring unique, the patented use of uh, two uncut backup rings, which are solid with no, no gaps, no springs, that they have a small amount of clearance over the rod. And as gas pressure builds in the cup, those rings will collapse down against the rod and aid in the sealing process. And we were able to manipulate when those rings close down against the rod by uh, careful material selection. So what are the benefits of this style of ring? First is a lower gas leakage in both running and shutdown conditions. Um, field testing has shown that uh, gas leakage has been extremely low after s several thousand running hours with this ring design. Um, you know, we have a flow meter that will go down to below 0 0.05 standard cubic feet per minute, which is a very low leakage level. And we've found that this ring, after several thousand hours, can still hold a leak rate that is too low for that flow meter to pick up, where a BTR ring set just simply could not do that. Um, next benefit is reduced friction. And this is the big thing that's going to extend the service life of your ring. So reducing friction lowers your rod temperatures and extends service life. Uh, it also uh, includes better sealing that requires fewer uh, ring sets. So in the example before, you know, a, a BTR ring set sealing 2,000 PSI of pressure would require four to five rings. We can do that in, in three rings with the BTUU. So that shortens our design envelope 
allows, uh, allows us to make a more compact offering. So the next slide shows you really how these rings load up. If you remember from our discussion with the BTR, essentially one ring is doing all the sealing against the rod, and that's the tangent ring. As you can see in this graph, you're just looking at the uh, cylinder pressure changing on the y-axis and the piston location changing on the x. As the gas pressure in the cylinder cycles from suction to discharge, the loading within the ring set changes from the tangent ring down here at low pressure. Once your cylinder pressure reaches a, a moderate point, this first uncut ring collapses against the rod and picks up the ceiling load. The next, the last uncut ring closes down as the pressure reaches discharge and picks up the ceiling load. So essentially you have three rings sharing the load compared to just one within the BTR ring set. So everybody remembers this slide from earlier showing how the BTR ring set breaks down the pressure um, as you move through the cup stack. So as you can see, you, know, you have one, two, three, four rings here that are depicted that are knocking down that gas pressure. Well, let's compare that to the same test using a BTUU ring arrangement. So you can see here the cylinder pressure in the, in the first cup, which is the pressure breaker, doesn't change. But you look here at the remaining cups, it's almost zero pressure. So basically one BTUU ring set is doing the job of four BTRs, and that's that's really what, what uh, helps us keep that heat down. Because if you can picture that BTR ring set, all four of those rings are squeezing the rod, creating heat and friction. The BTUU, you've got one. So what does that mean? Take a look at this next slide. Uh, this is, again, taken off of our test compressor. You look at the discharge pressure here on the x-axis increasing compared to rod temperature on the y. With the conventional packing arrangement using BTR sets, your yeah, temperature on your rod is anywhere from 290 up to 310 degrees Fahrenheit. Compare that to the BTUU, you're about 100 degrees Fahrenheit cooler. What that means for the life of your packing is extremely significant. You know, we hear reports in the field that um, the BTUU will last 50 to 100 percent longer than a standard uh, BTR type ring set. And so this is the technology we're moving forward with with IMW to help give, a, give the end customer the, the best available service life out of their machinery. So next, a uh, quick note on, on wiper rings. You know, we have a special design there called an RTV. Uh, and this type of ring has, features a proprietary joint design that is, uh, is meant to reject the, the oil before it gets into the groove. It also has a side-loaded gas sealing element that keeps uh, gas from leaking into the uh, crankcase, so it helps us reduce the overall uh, design envelope. So last couple slides here. First, I want to talk to you a little bit about the project we've been working on with IMW that involves a standard compressor lineup. So what this means is in the past where IMW compressors have been more customized for a, a particular application, we're moving away from that towards a, a standard product range of pre-designed cylinders and, and component designs that are, uh, are going to be used uh, for new compressor assemblies. So what this means is we're looking at this kind of a blank slate and making sure that we include best available sealing technology for non-lubricated CNG compressors. So we're looking at things like BTUU seals that uh, include optimized uh, materials that allow us to uh, work very well over a full range of operating conditions. Uh, next, we'll look at a, a series of custom design piston rings that use joint designs and materials that minimize wear and blow by. And while I say custom, they'll be custom for each cylinder. However, that cylinder will, will be a, the rings assigned to that particular cylinder will be standard. And what that does for us is that condenses the available number of configurations and the number of parts down to a minimal number. For example, we're looking at only having two different BTUU unique ring sets that cover the entire range of operating conditions. So what that means for us is if you're out in the field and you need a spare set of rings, since there's only two available ring sets, there's a very good chance that either Cook or IMW is going to have that set available for you, um, which is a big benefit for, for spares planning. Additionally, the lead time of the equipment is going to be much shorter since the packages will be pre-engineered. And um, 
And lastly, the design envelope is going to be, be much shorter. Since we're using this uh, the BTU style seals, we're able to compact that, uh, that packing case, which allows benefit in the uh, compressor design as well. So to wrap things up, I'll go over some key takeaways here. Um, first is that high service life can be achieved in non-lubricated CNG compression when the proper considerations are taken. So again, simply turning off the switch on a lubricated compressor is not going to get you the results you need. You need a machine that is custom designed to work in a non-lubricated environment. Uh, next, the enemies of, of compressor components are heat and oil carryover. So especially in non-lube applications. So to maximize life, we're going to use a combination of product designs and wear materials that are specifically aimed for reducing heat generation and limiting oil carryover and minimizing wear rates through a proper material specification. Next, uh, cleanliness precautions are critical during maintenance to promote proper material transfer film development. So again, that goes back to making sure that you're cleaning off all the sealing surfaces and, and, and not introducing any oil into the uh, environment. And lastly, standardized IMW compressors will utilize best available technology for the components with the goal of achieving high service life, low lead times, and high spare parts availability. So any questions? Excellent. Okay, John, I, I do have a couple. I'm wondering, uh, but while we're asking them, Tim had asked, uh, would you please show the slot, the solid ring again? Okay. Uh, the slide went by a bit fast, so while you're going there. Uh, this one? I believe that. Hopefully that's it, Tim. Um, <laughs> and Jermaine asked, do the rings perform better and longer in cold weather than in very hot climates, or is it irrelevant? The climate doesn't have as big an impact as you think it does, um, again, because most of the heat in the environment is due to the local conditions. So what a, hot, uh, what a hot environment would do, it may increase the gas temperature being introduced into the compressor and, and may increase your suction temperature, which will in turn increase your discharge gas temperature. But the majority of the heat we're concerned with is the friction generated at the sealing surface, and that's not going to be as impacted as you may think by the by the uh, outside environment. Gotcha. Tim was open. You could go a couple of slides earlier there. Apparently, it's a couple of this one. Uh, we'll, we'll see if that's the one. Uh, while we're waiting on Tim, there um, several folks have asked will we be able to receive the uh, slides, and uh, we will be sending a survey uh, email next week, and uh, it will include links to the slide deck. And we'll also be editing and posting uh, this webinar on the IMW website. So uh, you can uh, certainly access it there. Now, Tim is acknowledging, yes, that's the correct slide. But how do you get it on the rod? Well, you have to use a, a neck down thread design, meaning that the diameter of the threads on the piston rod must be smaller than the diameter of the, of the main piston rod ceiling area. So. You would have to install these rings into the packing assembly, install the assembly in the back of the cylinder, then plunge the rod down through the uh, through your cylinder and in through the packing ring. So maybe if I back up here to the component slide. So basically what you'll do is you'll install this assembly here first where my mouse is, is floating. So all those rings will be kind of held in place. Then you'll take the piston rod and install it right down the middle of this packing assembly. Now you'll use a, a device called a thread protector over the rod threads to keep the, the rings from getting damaged. But by having that thread diameter that's smaller than the main diameter of the piston rod, it's able to, to slide in through those uncut rings. Excellent. Now David uh, has asked an excellent question, which I'd asked you earlier. Uh, we've got an IMW50 um, built in 05. Could we get these new packing systems to improve our machine performance? And uh, just to put this into perspective, David, um, uh, Cook is working with our manager of research and development on this project. This has been a, a co-development effort, and I'm sure John can speak to this more. Uh, these products have not been fully um, uh, tested yet. We have five test sites where we're undergoing uh, the prototype versions. Uh, when they are released, uh, yes, 
they will be, as opposed to our friends at Microsoft, they will be backwards compatible. Uh, so you will be able to retrofit your previous IMW 50s with the new technology. Uh, anything to add to that, John? Um, no, I think it, it's once we get it done on the standard units, you know, we can go back and, and retrofit a design for any any compressor out in the field today. So that's certainly something we can do. Okay. Now we are uh, we're exactly one minute over, but we did start one minute late, so we'll we'll grab a few of these questions here while folks are still able. Are there any considerations for the compressors with low usage, i.e. long periods of inactivity? Doug asked that. I think the main concern there is, would be preservation of components, you know, making sure that if you're down and you're not, um, not pressurized for an extended period of time, it may be worthwhile to, to take the components apart and make sure that no rust is built up anywhere in the system that could, could interfere with the, with the sealing components. But um, you know, as far as, I guess it would depend on how long you consider it to be a long shutdown. If you're just up, you know, maybe at a 25% utilization, you're down for a day here or there, not a big deal. But if you're down for months at a time, then you may want to consider taking things apart and, and reinspecting before going back online. Okay. Um, Ahmed asks, what about the effect of intermittent lubrication due to wear in, in the oil wiper, uh, is there a material that can work halfway between lubricated and non-lubricated cylinders? Well, there are certainly, if you're, you're kind of um, in that environment where oil is, is carrying over, you know, the transfer film gets washed away. So that intermittent lubrication is probably the worst case scenario for any ring material. Um, because you, if you're running completely lubricated, you, know, you don't have to worry about a transfer of film. But once that oil goes away, the film is laid. Well, then here comes the lube back due to the poor wiper performance, knocks that oil, uh, knocks the transfer film away. So to answer the question about is there a better material, yes, there are materials that run better than others in that environment. But I think our approach to that would be let's let's attack the source here and find out why the wiper is not performing the way it should. And let's fix the wiper so we don't have to just put a Band-Aid on the on the ceiling rings and okay. get them to survive. Now, it looks like your comments uh, earlier on and your introduction have uh, piqued Ivan's interest. He <laughs> asks, what are the tools that we can use for predictive maintenance? Well, uh, our, our Windrock product line um, gives the end user an ability to see what's going on inside the compressor. And, and I'll stay at this slide for an example. Um, so what that would typically involve are pressure and temperature transducers that are directly introduced into the cylinder. So you can see the rate and the, uh, the pressure changes and the pressure drops across the valves, um, how much leakage is going, going past your piston rings. Um, you can really look at that data that's being taken inside the compressor cylinder and use that to determine you know, A, is your compressor performing like it's supposed to? Is your flow and horsepower and, and, and everything like that in line? And B, are there any problems with any of the components? So you can pick that up by looking at these pressure and uh, temperature traces and also looking at vibration uh, at different points within the, the compressor itself. So, for example, if a valve went out, uh, you could pick that up with a, a vibration trace at a specific point in the compressor. So it allows you to really see rather than just saying every 10,000 hours, I'm going to tear my compressor down and change parts, it allows you to, to change, you know, do maintenance as is actually needed versus doing maintenance as is unnecessary. Okay. Well, we are out of time. We've got a little over. We want to be respectful of those boardrooms full of engineers out there. So uh, I have had multiple questions. Where can we get the, uh, the slide deck? Again, the slide, there will be a survey coming out uh, early next week. There will be a link to the slide deck. In addition, we will be editing and posting this entire webinar on the IMW website, and we ex we, we invite you to, uh, to to pop in there and see it. Uh, for those of you who have a few questions that are popping up here at the very end that we just can't attend to, uh, please feel free to contact myself um, or uh, just send an email to sales at imw.ca. That's sales at imw.ca. And if you reference the webinar and your question, we'll be happy to get back to you and, and work with John on that. Mm -hmm.